Hi, my name is Magnar Nordahl. I am a captain and instructor on ATR-42 and 72 aircraft. This video is about the power plant used in ATR aircraft, the Pratt & Whitney Canada PW100 series. This is a comprehensive subject, therefore I have divided it into four parts. Part 1 gives a general description of the engine. If you haven't seen it yet, I recommend you to watch it before you continue with this one. This is part 2 and is about the engine's gas turbine. Part 3 is about the propeller and part 4 is about operating procedures. This video is intended to give an oversight of the engine. And I might have made mistakes and if I did, please notify me and I will make a notification below here. For a fully detailed description of the variant you are flying, please read the FCOM, the Flight Crew Operating Manual, DSC Chapter 70. But stay put because I have added some information you won't find in the manuals. The air intake is located below the engine. The air follows an S-shaped pattern to the compressor. Heavy objects such as ice move horizontally into a secondary duct. ATA aircraft had two different air intake designs. ATA 42 300, 320 and 400 have two external air intakes. One for the engine and one for the oil cooler. The secondary duct ends in a slot where the air is expelled. All of the ATR variants have a single air intake where the oil cooler is at the end of the secondary duct. The air is compressed by two contra-rotating centrifugal compressors. The low pressure compressor, LP compressor, and the high pressure compressor, HP compressor. A centrifugal compressor is also known as a radial compressor or impeller. When the air exits a centrifugal compressor, it moves outwards. Pipe diffusers are used to direct the air to the second compressor. Compared to an axial compressor, the centrifugal compressor is simpler and more robust in design, but it gives the engine a larger diameter. The PW127 has a compression ratio of 15.77 and an airflow of 8.49 kg per second. That's 30.5 tons of air per hour. Two thirds of that air is used to combust the fuel. The rest is used to cool the engine and to supply other systems such as the air conditioning. We call this bleed air. Bleed air is extracted from two places. LP air or P2.5 is vented from the HP compressor intake. HP air or P3 is vented from the HP compressor outlet. Maximum bleeder extraction for external use is 10% of 15 kg per minute from the HP compressor and 10% from the LP compressor except for PW120, 121 and 121 alpha variants which have 8%. This bleeder supplies the air conditioning system, the de-icing system, the fuel controller, the HMU, the outflow valves in the pressurization system, and in ATR-72 without PEC, it is used to move the condition level fully forward when power is increased during a go-around. Most systems use HP bleed air. However, at high power, LP bleed air is used to supply the air conditioning system. Bleed air is also used to cool the engine and to provide a positive pressure in the lubrication system. The engine has an annular reverse flow combustion chamber. An annular chamber is shaped like a donut. Earlier engines had a tubular combustion chambers, like this General Electric J33, which was used in the Lockheed T33 shooting star. The benefit in an annular combustion chamber is that it provides a more even heat distribution to the turbine inlet. Reverse flow means that the air flows in a S-shaped pattern, this makes the combustion chamber more compact. The combustion chamber has two walls. The inner wall has a ceramic coating. Cooling is provided by bleed air which flows between the walls. This is the fuel nozzle where the fuel is sprayed into the combustion chamber at high pressure and vaporizes. The fuel burns rapidly with a temperature close to 2000 degrees Celsius. More air is introduced through slots to complete the combustion. Further down, additional air is added through slots and mixed with the hot gases. 
This cools the gases sufficiently to prevent damages to the inlet of the turbine. Here is a combustion chamber of a Rolls-Royce NEN engine. The air comes from the compressor to the left, and here is the fuel nozzle. Air enters the combustion chamber through those small holes. It's mixed with the fuel vapor and burned. More air enters here, and cooling air enters through those holes before the gases enter the turbine. The gas turbine has two turbines, the HP turbine and the LP turbine. The hot gases are guided by airfoil shaped guide vanes to the HP turbine. I don't have a picture of the interior of the PDRB127, but this picture shows the turbine section of another engine. Some of the vanes are removed, but you can see them up there. In the PDRB127, the vanes are hollow and cooled by bleed air. The HP turbine blades are also hollow just like the turbine in this picture. This prevents the blades from melting. As the hot gases flow through the HP turbine, some of the energy is converted to mechanical energy, causing the turbine to rotate. This causes the gas pressure and the temperature to decrease. By acting on the HP shaft, the HP turbine drives the HP compressor and the accessory gearbox. The ITT sensor is located behind the HP turbine, Another row of guide vanes directs the gas flow to the LP turbine. Neither the vanes nor the turbine blades are cooled. The LP turbine drives the LP compressor. More energy is transferred and gas pressure and temperature decrease again. Finally, the gases enter the power turbine, which has two sections, and this drives the reduction gearbox and the propeller. This figure shows the distribution of gas pressure and gas temperature inside a PDRB127 engine when it's producing maximum power at sea level on a standard day. The black numbers represent the various stations. At station 1, in the air inlet, the air temperature, T1, is plus 15 degrees Celsius and the air pressure, P1, is 14.7 psi. T2 and P2 are located at the inlet to the LP compressor. Temperature and pressure are unchanged. At the HP compressor inlet is T2.5, 190 degrees Celsius, and P2.5 is close to 80 psi. This is LP bleed air. At station 3, the HP compressor outlet is T3, 400 degrees Celsius, and P3, 230 psi. This is HP bleed air. At the HP turbine inlet is T4, 1150 degrees Celsius, and P4 about 190 psi. At the HP compressor outlet is T5, 800 degrees Celsius. This is where the ITT is measured. And P5 is about 95 psi. At the LP compressor outlet is T6. 600 degrees Celsius and P6 is slightly below 40 psi. At the free turbine outlet is T7, 450 degrees Celsius and P7 is close to atmospheric pressure. The oil system is used to lubricate the bearings in the gas turbine and accessory gearbox and for cooling. The oil tank is located in the lower left hand side of the gas turbine. There's a refill cap on the top and a side glass on the side. Bleed air provides a positive pressure to the lubrication system. A circular flap door on the engine covering allows for checking the oil level without opening the covering. From the oil tank, the oil flows to the oil pump, which is driven by the accessory gearbox. When the oil is cold, it flows slowly and there might be pressure surges. To prevent this, there is a low temperature pressure relief valve that returns some of the oil back to the tank. After the pump, the oil flows to the air-cooled oil cooler. On ATR42-300, 320 and 400, the cooler is located below the engine air intake duct. On all of the ATR variants, the cooler is located aft of the engine air intake duct. The airflow through the oil cooler is controlled by one or two flaps, which are operated by a thermal actuator. They are fully closed when the oil temperature is below 71 degrees Celsius and start to open when the temperature increases. There is also a thermostatic bypass valve that is fully open when the oil temperature is below 71 degrees Celsius and fully closed when the oil temperature is above 81 degrees Celsius. 
Next, there's a pressure regulating valve that maintains the oil pressure at around 60 psi. Excessive oil is returned to the tank. Then, the oil flows through a filter. A bypass valve opens if the filter is clogged. From here, the oil will either continue to the propeller reduction gearbox, RGB, via the fuel heater and the oil-cooled oil cooler, or to the gas turbine. The oil system in the reduction gearbox is explained in part 3. Oil heading for the gas turbine will pass a pressure switch and a pressure transducer. As you learned in part 1 of this video, when the pressure switch senses less than 40 psi, the crew alert system is triggered, except for the first 30 seconds during engine start. The pressure transducer is connected to the pressure indicator. When the oil pressure is less than 40 psi, a red light illuminates in the indicator. This is called a local alert. Then, we have a temperature sensor connected to the temperature indicator. The glass cockpit has the following indications. When the pressure is less than 40 psi, the flight warning system is triggered and a red low pressure label appears on the oil pressure indicator. The oil is then distributed to the accessory gearbox and its drive and the bearings. The gas turbine has seven bearings. Number one, two and seven are supporting the power shaft. Number three and six are supporting the LP shaft. And bearings number four and five are supporting the HP shaft. The oil is returned to the oil tank by gravity or by a scavenging pump, which is driven by the accessory gearbox. In the oil tank, there is a magnetic ship detector. This picture shows metal particles on the detector after an engine failure. Finally, oil from the propeller reduction gearbox is returned to the tank via a duct inside the engine air inlet, which uses the heat from the oil for anti-icing and a scavenge pump and a filter. In a previous video, I described the airplane's fuel system. The link is below here. Now it's time to talk about the engine's fuel system. The engine receives fuel from the fuel feeder tank via the LP valve. From here, the fuel enters a filter and heater unit. The filter's mesh size is 74 microns or 0.074 millimeters. If the filter gets clogged, it will flow through a bypass valve. Then, the filter passes a fuel heater, which exchanges heat with the engine oil. At the outlet of the fuel heater, there is a temperature sensor. Next, the fuel enters the fuel pump unit. Here, the fuel passes through a second 74 microns filter before it enters the pump. From the pump, the fuel passes a filter with a mesh size of 10 microns. If this filter gets clogged, the fuel pressure will increase at 25 psi, a fuel clog alert is triggered. At 45 psi, a bypass valve will open. After the filter, the fuel enters the hydromechanical unit, the HMU, or the mechanical fuel control unit. Here, things get a bit complicated. The HMU has a delicate collection of levers, bellows, and valves, and regulates fuel flow to the fuel nozzles in response to the power requirements. The HMU can be controlled electronically or manually with the power lever. Inside the HMU, the fuel flow is regulated by a metering valve. In PW120 and 121 engines, the metering valve is controlled by a torque motor, which in turn is controlled by the ECU, engine control unit. In case of ECU failure, fuel flow is controlled with the power lever. In all other engine variants, the metering valve is controlled by a stepper motor, which in turn is controlled by the EEC, engine electronic control. In case of EEC failure, fuel flow is controlled with the power lever. A governor driven by the accessory gearbox protects against NH overspeed by reducing fuel flow through the metering valve. Excess fuel is routed through a bypass valve back to the pump, or through a multi-flow valve back to the fuel tank. At the outlet of the HMU, there is a shut-off valve, which is controlled with the condition lever. The valve is open when the condition lever is out of the fuel shut-off position. After HMU, the fuel passes a fuel flow meter, which consists of a rotor and a capacitor that measures the density of the fuel. This allows the fuel flow indicator to indicate the fuel consumption in kilograms or pounds per hour. Next, fuel is heated again, this time in the fuel-cooled oil cooler. 
then the fuel approaches the fuel divider. When the fuel pressure from the HMU is high, the divider allows for fuel to exit through a primary flow port and a secondary flow port. There are 14 fuel nozzles. The primary fuel line supplies 10 of them. The secondary flow line supplies all 14 nozzles. When the fuel pressure is low, the secondary flow port is closed. When the fuel shutoff valve is closed, there is no fuel pressure in the line. This opens both flow ports and a dump valve, allowing for remaining fuel in the lines to flow by gravity to a drain tank located under the engine. When the engine has been started again, a fuel line from the HMU to the drain tank runs a jet pump, which removes fuel stored in the drain tank and returns it to the fuel pump. Early ATRs did not have a drain tank and the fuel was ejected to the ground when you shut on the engine. Finally, here are the engine fuel indications in the glass cockpit. The ignition system is used to start the engine. It requires 28 volts DC, but can operate on 10 to 30 volts. The system consists of two ignition exciters, A and B, two ignition cables and two igniter plugs. The exciter delivers 8000 volts. And this is serious stuff. Just watch this. Okay, Big Al, we're going to test an ignition system. This is a jet spark compared to a car spark. Go, Walter. That's blinding. That's a good one. The spark igniters are located at the 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock positions on the combustion chamber. When starting the engine, the pilot can select igniter A, igniter B, or both with the engine start rotary selector. During engine start, the igniters are activated when the conditioner is moved from fuel shutoff to feather, and deactivated when NH reaches 45%. On engines without PEG, the start rotary selector has a position, continuous relight, for manual selection of continuous ignition. It is used for takeoff, approach, and when a procedure calls for it. Some 872s are the modification where igniters are only activated when continuous relight is selected on and NH drops below 66%. All ATA variants with PEC have automatic ignition. When the engine is running and NH drops below 60%, both igniters are activated. The ignition rate is 5 to 6 sparks per second for the first 25 seconds, then 1 spark per second. Automatic ignition is inhibited when NH drops below 30%, or EEC selected off, or the condition level is in feather or fuel shut off position, or on the fed engine during an ATPCS sequence. A push button allows for manual selection of continuous ignition. The ignition rate is 5 to 6 sparks per second for the first 25 seconds, then 1 spark per second. Here is one important thing to remember. Manual ignition overrides automatic ignition and must only be used in accordance with the checklist for EEC fault in the following cases. Icing condition, engine flame out, emergency descent, severe turbulence or heavy rain. However, if you use manual ignition without reason, and it has been on for more than 25 seconds at the time of our engine flame out. It will give only one spark per second and not five to six sparks. This might potentially delay the automatic relight process. ATR42-300 and 320 are equipped with the PDRB120 and 121 engines respectively. The engines are equipped with the ECU, engine control unit. On the engine control panel, there is a push button for each ECU. During normal operation, the push buttons are always in. An amber fault light illuminates when the ECU has failed and when the engine is stopped. During engine start, the light extinguishes when NH is more than 25%. When the ECU is operative, it controls fuel flow by acting on the torque motor in the HMU. The ECU monitors power level position and atmospheric conditions. The ECU ensures that engine power is constant when the conditions change, for example during climb, without the need to adjust the power levers. However, the ECU is not perfect. 
ancient torque may vary with the air speed because of ram air effect. When the speed is increased, more air is pushed into the engine and vice versa. After engine start, the propeller turns with about 14.5% NP and NH is about 66%. Before taxi, the condition level is set to max RPM. The ECU commands the HMU to provide sufficient fuel flow to maintain 70.8% NP. This is called fuel governing. Moving the condition level between max RPM and minimum RPM does not affect NP. In fuel governing, the power lever acts directly on the propeller control unit, PCU, controlling propeller pitch. In ground idle, each propeller produces 150 kg of thrust. This is sufficient for taxi. When you need more thrust, you move the power lever a bit forward. Zero and negative thrust is achieved by moving the power lever backwards towards the reverse. This provides speed control during taxi. Full reverse produces 300 kg forward thrust. When the power lever is advanced for takeoff and NP starts to increase, the transition mode has started. The transition mode ends when NP corresponds with the position of the condition lever. At takeoff, it's 100% NP. This is when the blade governing mode takes over. In blade governing mode, the condition lever controls NP through the PCU. This is described in part 3. The power lever controls NH and with it, the torque. Target torque is computed by the FDAU, Flight Data Acquisition Unit, based on the position of the power management selector and atmospheric conditions provided by the air data computer and displayed on the torque indicator. In case an ECU phase in flight, there is a certain drop in engine torque. This must not be confused with an engine flame mode, which is associated with a total loss of torque. When the ECU is inoperative, the power lever controls the fuel flow directly by acting on the HMU. In order to maintain required power, the power lever must be set further ahead than normal. Without ECU, the engine accelerates slower than normal and decelerates faster than normal. To protect you from power loss at takeoff, the HMU has a fail fix function that will maintain current fuel flow and therefore the torque. The procedure is described in part 4. When landing with an inoperative ECU and power is reduced, NP will decrease below 70.8% and into the amber sector of the NP indicator. This is further described in part 4. Except for PW120 and 121 engines, all ATA engines have engine electronic control, EEC, which has more functions than the ECU. In fuel governing mode, the engine handles as before, the power lever controls propeller pitch. And just a little note here, I skipped engines with the PEC because the propeller control is described fully in part 3. In blade angle governing mode, there are changes. The HMU operates in accordance with two laws, top law, EEC is operative, and base law, EEC is inoperative. In top law, the EEC receives information from the air data computer, the FDAU, the power management selector, and P and H and torque indications, and the bleed valve. When the power lever is set in the notch, the EEC commands the HMU to deliver maximum torque as computed by the FDAU. At takeoff, you get normal takeoff power. To set climb power, you set the power management selector to climb and this reduces the workload of the flight crew. When the power lever is ahead of 52 degrees, which is marked with a green band, and the EEC fails, a fail fix function will maintain current fuel flow, and the EEC fault light will flash. When the power lever is in the green band below 52 degrees, there will be a drop in torque, and the EEC fault light is then steady. Furthermore, the EEC controls the handling bleed valve, HBV, which controls the airflow from the LP compressor to the HP compressor. There are times when the LP compressor delivers too much air to the HP compressor, and this might result in surge or compressor stall. To prevent this, excess LP air is dumped overboard with the handling bleed valve. If the EEC cannot control the HBV, the valve is closed. 
On AFIS variants, it's indicated as dashes on the digital torque indicator, and in a glass cockpit variants, it's indicated with an amber HPV label. The accessory gearbox is driven by the HP spool and contains drives for the DC starter generator, the HP fuel pump, the main oil pump and two scavenge pumps. The oil pumps are grouped in a single unit on the right hand side of the engine. When the starter is engaged, it drives the HP shaft. The starter disengages at 45% NH and the engine completes the start sequence by itself. Afterwards, when NP reaches 61.5%, the starter generator acts as a generator. The PW127 engine produces 90% torque at takeoff. When installed in an ATS72 at sea level, 90% torque can be maintained at temperatures up to plus 30 degrees Celsius when the bleed is on, and up to plus 35 degrees Celsius when the bleed is off. When it gets warmer, available power is reduced, which in turn might reduce the takeoff weight. For example, at plus 40 degrees, the torque is reduced to 87% when the bleed is off and 84% when the bleed is on. Increasing the airport elevation gives the same effect. When it's 30 degrees at 4000 feet, the torque is 82% when the bleed is off. With reduced power, the payload and therefore the revenue is reduced. In order to improve takeoff performance in hot and high conditions with the ATS 72, the PW127M can be equipped with a boost function. Boost increases the thermal limitations for takeoff and MCT power. It can give up to 4.5% higher torque, which means that the aircraft can carry up to 500 kg extra weight. For example, when you compare engine torque at 30 degrees at 4000 feet, the torque is 82 without boost and 86% with boost. This means more revenue for the company, but if you use the boost on every takeoff, the engine life will be reduced by 20%. Therefore, you should only use boost when it's necessary. So what we do is to compute the regulatory takeoff weight with and without boost before we load the aircraft. When we receive the load sheet, we check the actual takeoff weight and decide whether boost is necessary or not. In 2014, a customer in Colombia started to receive ATR 72600 with a new engine variant, the PW127N. This engine has an upgraded boost function called a Super Boost. Compared to the boost in the 127M engine, the Super Boost function in the 127N engine gives another 3.5% extra torque. This is necessary because the airport in the capital of Colombia, Bogota, has an elevation of 8,710 feet and a daily average temperature is plus 15 degrees Celsius. If the pressure altitude is 8,000 feet, the engine will produce 79% without boost, 82% with normal boost and 86% torque with a super boost. This makes a big difference. If you want to learn more about aircraft takeoff performance, you will find a link below. And this concludes the presentation on the gas turbine. Please proceed to part 3, which gives a detailed description of the propeller. Please support my channel by clicking like and share with your friends. Thank you for watching, have a wonderful day and happy learning!